Hi, this is Rodrigo from Frame Freak Studio, and this is the Creative Hustler Show. Today, we have a legendary guest here with us. Uh, his name is Nathan Cox. He is pretty much a legendary illustrator. Uh, he was the author of his first book, I think it's called How to Draw Portraits in Charcoal. He's a concept artist for animation and entertainment projects. Uh, he's also a teacher uh, on drawing, painting, color, and design. Uh, and he has worked for clients such as DreamWorks, Blue Sky, Disney, for movies like Rio 2, The Legend of the Boots, uh, Shrek, and uh, The Road to El Dorado. So, welcome, Nathan. Good to see you guys. Good to see you, Rodrigo. So, first of all, uh, what I would like to ask you is about your history. How did you get started into art? Uh, was something that you were doing since you were a kid, or was something that you took later on? Sure, it was. Um, I, all kids like to draw, and then eventually just find what they're interested in. And uh, I was just the kid that never stopped drawing. I, I couldn't stop if I wanted to. So, yeah, I, uh, I just kept going. I was sure I wanted to be an artist from a young age. Went to art school. Uh, uh, had to kind of fight to find my direction and found my way to DreamWorks Animation. And it's been an absolutely fantastic ride. Um, you know, my, uh, uh, my dad told me, he said, uh, well, gosh, maybe you could work in a museum to get a steady paycheck and then do art, you know, do your personal art on your own time. You know, I, I want grandchildren. I want them to have a, a roof overhead, you know, and a, a steady paycheck coming in. So this artist thing. Uh, so when I started working at, at DreamWorks and had that steady paycheck, and I didn't tell my dad that my ch paycheck was bigger than his was. I just kept that to myself. <laughs> nice. It's a good life. It's a good life as an artist. Uh, lately, I feel that this narrative uh, that everybody has, uh, we went through it as well that if you go into art that you are going to be struggling with money and such things now i think it is changing however many people are not realizing that and i think this career in arts is becoming the a stable thing uh how does it look from your point of view uh, all the changes that are coming to the industry yeah it's um you know there is not there has not been a better time in history to be an artist there's so many opportunities, there's so much going on. The difficulty is that uh, everybody knows this, and so a lot of people want to get in the game. But that's a good thing. That means it draws the best talent, it draws the most dedicated people. The fight is, you know, there's a sea of 100,000 people, maybe a lot more than that, that would love to get in the game. And it means the rest of us have to fight as hard as we can to stand above that crowd any way we can. And so we have to uh, we have to work, we have to be innovative, we have to work a little bit harder than the next guy might be to make sure those opportunities uh, come our way. Also, something that I wanted to ask you, how was your career into learning the art? Because at the beginning, when we were kids, like, we were just drawing whatever it comes. But how did you start learning into becoming like, a true professional in this career? Kind of kind of diving in head first, because when I went to art school, you know, I, uh, I'm primarily an animation artist. I, I do my own personal work as well. And when I went to art school, there was no entertainment design animation program. There was nothing like that. There was some good instruction, and I tried to take advantage of that as best I could. But for instance, the art school that I went to was very much entrenched in kind of 1970s, 1980s editorial illustration, because that's where commercial art had been for the last 20 years. And so it, there was a natural tendency to push people in that direction. I remember I was a couple of terms into art school, and I went and saw Jurassic Park, which was the big, you know, blockbuster hit movie back in the uh, early 90s. That, and I came out of that and I went back to my studio and I looked at what was on my desk and I was kind of letting myself get pushed into what the teachers wanted the students to do. And I said to myself, I don't want to have anything to do with this. 
anymore. And so I went to my teachers and said, look, I'm going to do movie art. And so I'm going to mold these assignments towards that. And, you know, I'm not going to take no for an answer. You know, I, I know exactly what I want to do now. But us coming out, there was a group of us coming out of the Art Center College of Design back in the early 90s. And we were so lucky. Uh, we had the same attitude. We wanted to hit that, hit that mark. And we came out of art school right when that wave was cresting, where animation just started to boom. And uh, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. And that was the same time where 3D was coming along, right? Because I remember Toy Story came like in 95. And yep. then it was like the huge boom of doing computer animation where before like uh, animators were considering that 3D animation or computer animation was not a thing, right? I am, you know, I am so proud. My generation created the CG animated movie. Now, I'm not taking any kind of personal credit. It would have happened. It would have gone along just fine without me, but I got to be part of it. And so that was that was my generation, and uh, it was an amazing time, and still is. Uh, awesome. Something, something that uh, pretty much where we found you was through the Scholism. And yeah. it was when the Kickstarter started like happening because before Scholism was not something that was available for everybody. And now plenty of my team has gone to the classes through there. Uh, many of them have taken their classes, uh, which everybody was like really excited when when I told them, hey, like Nathan Fox said yes for the interview. Uh, how do you think that internet uh, in your experience, uh, where do you see that internet is molding the industry now uh, from the point of learning and the point of also the industry itself? It's creating so many opportunities because every major city in the world, I mean, almost without exception, in those cities, there are game and animation studios popping up. But in many places in the world, they don't have local experience. You know, uh, Los Angeles here where I live, obviously with, with Disney and everything else, uh, we've been in the game for a century. And uh, other places just don't happen to have had that background. And so they need experience. And so uh, I'm able to participate in two ways. Uh, one, as a, uh, as a teacher, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a full-time animation artist, but I find a little time each week to do some teaching. And so people anywhere in the world can take my classes. We have a, we, we have, a, don't just take mine, the other instructors at Schoolism, extraordinary. Uh, name the studio, Pixar, Disney, DreamWorks, Paramount, Ubisoft, Blizzard, any studio you can name. We have instructors at Schoolism who either work currently for those companies or they have and have that experience. So, uh, so people anywhere in the world can take those classes. At the same time, I've had the opportunity, like right now I'm working with a couple of Chinese companies and uh, I've had the opportunity to work with these companies over the internet where they don't have the local experience and I can jump in, jump in and work remotely from home and, uh, and be a part of it. So it's, uh, it's miraculous. Yeah, nice. Yeah, definitely. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Uh, of my country, there is no opportunities like you mentioned. Like the closest thing to uh, to this kind of art that we have is like the career of graphic design, which is like completely different from what we want to focus. So for us, as cool as it was like, well, <laughs> we blew our minds completely. Also. Uh, what do you feel uh, is like a downfall from learning from the internet in comparison to learning from teachers physically in the classroom? Yeah, uh, everything has its downside. Uh, one thing that I, I think everyone should watch out for when you when you uh, go on the internet to study, watch YouTube videos, you know, and, and grab any and all of the resources that are out there, that's an amazing thing. But you don't know what you don't know. 
And so when you're involved in a more designed curriculum, people with experience will show you, you need this class, you need to learn on this subject. And uh, you know, a, a student uh, at the beginning of a learning curve won't know that they needed to study a particular subject. And so it opens you up to things that you wouldn't have thought of studying, but might be an important part of your education. At the same time, you know, there's kind of the internet quick, let's get it done in 10 minutes. And uh, I think every once, if I do a demo that goes longer than 10 minutes, every once in a while someone will make a comment, you know, um, can you, you know, can you speed it up? Uh, I intentionally don't, I don't, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be a part of that. I want to set a context because that lends itself to an attitude of what are the cool tools, you know, show me a 10 minute demo of how you use your brushes. Let me download your brush pack and Oh, look, you know, with this brush pack, I can, uh, I can drop in clouds in the sky. I can use the cityscape brush. I can do the tree brush and then a grass brush and boom, I have a painting. I'm an artist and maybe the painting looks pretty good and I'm not against it. You know, use the tools, use the power of the tools. But when that's your attitude, it sets a low ceiling for you. And there's, underlying principles that put that ceiling like I talked about at the top getting your head above the crowd and getting noticed so kind of the quick tricks of the tools is the thing that um, uh, sets a very low ceiling uh, that I don't think creates the opportunities that we're looking for and I can add Rodrigo I can I can mention something that happened at, at DreamWorks because it was a good lesson uh, we had James Cameron come to DreamWorks. I, I worked at DreamWorks for 15 years, and now I'm independent. I'm uh, uh, Nathan Falk Studio uh, in, Incorporated here as my own studio now. But uh, James Cameron came right after Avatar came out, and DreamWorks invited him to specifically talk about how they use technology, because at the time, that was the most cutting-edge technological show that had been done. And so he came, he gave a great speech, but he said one thing that I really appreciated as an artist, I think everyone else out there will be as well. He said, you know, I, I got to tell you in this discussion we're having about technology, every single technology I've used over the entirety of my career has within a matter of years become 100% obsolete. And there's only one tool that I use that hasn't and never will. He said, the pencil, the pencil. He said, I can't wait for my artist to create a model, put it up on the screen, you know, and let it turn, and plug the thing in and, and wait for things to render. I have to have a team of artists that can sketch out ideas, put them up on the wall, respond to those ideas, take down the, the ones that aren't working, keep moving in the directions that are working. We got to move. And so when it comes to technology, it has to be driven by the pencil. And what he means by the pencil, of course, is principles of visual communication that influence every medium, every visual medium that we use. That's where the foundation is. How do you visually communicate with an audience? How do you capture their emotions and tell them stories? That's the foundation. I definitely agree with you. I had the love that I also spent a little while um, studying system engineering and something that was very clear for me after three years is that the study like uh, system engineering and technology was kind of a two-edged sword because of one way like you were learning kind of the basis to technology but on the other side like by the end that you finish learning that in the school system, everything was obsolete. Like new versions had come up, and and the technology that that is like the constant. That if you go for five years or four years into a college, when you go out, everything that you learn is already obsolete. So pretty much you just have the basics. So that is something I totally agree with you. Also, on your since you are a teacher, uh, you are in a very special place and this is a question that i will that i like to ask to every person that i interview whenever you see people are starting into this path of art 
uh, what are the most common mistakes that you see them making that they do not realize that they are making? Coming back to the point of you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so so the main one would be the one that I just mentioned. You know, we, we all we're desperate to do good looking work and we want to do it now. And so kind of uh, falling prey, I, I call it the, the path to the dark side, you know, the quick, easy road to power. Um, that's a temptation. It's kind of the human story. You know, the bad guy always want to take the shortcut to power, you know, instead of, uh, uh, instead of developing a unique skills, the bad guy just picks up a weapon, you know, something anyone can do. And it's it's the path to the dark side, and so uh, uh, to to take that analogy further, you know, you uh, uh, you pick up a sword, and you can do extraordinary damage. You can start swinging that sword around and do a lot of damage real fast. Except when they send someone to take you out who really knows how to use a sword, who's trained, you're down in three seconds. It's over. You didn't have a chance. And that's how it is with the digital tools. You can do some powerful things right out of the box, but this idea that we just talked about of having the found, you know, fighting through developing the foundation it is the thing that will just power right over the top of the people who aren't willing to take the time to do that. And the other thing, it's the thing I talk about a lot. Uh, thank you for mentioning my, my book at the top, uh, How to Draw Portraits in Charcoal, because I've also taught uh, traditional drawing and painting uh, for many years as part of the foundation. And the way we perceive things is not always, uh, is not always useful in communicating them visually. And so one of the biggest mistakes people make is everybody notice what the contrasts are. And so you look at a figure, for instance, you're learning the foundation of life drawing. You look at a figure and you think you're drawing what you see, but your eyes are, are, are hardwired to notice where the contrast is. That makes sense. That's where the information is. That's the job of your eyes. And so people do the figure drawing and they come away with a figure that looks like a sack of walnuts instead of a, a beautiful, graceful, flowing person. And they say, you know, how did this happen? I was drawing it exactly the way I saw it, as carefully as I could. I don't understand how it went so wrong. Well, they thought they were drawing it the way that they thought. I thought when I started out, I, I was so baffled about how my drawings went so terribly wrong. I wasn't drawing what I saw. I was noticing individual contrasts and I was drawing those without noticing how they all properly relate to each other. And so that's the biggest in traditional drawing and painting. And that's the foundation of digital painting as well. That's actually the number one problem. Our perceptions work against us. And so my classes always start out with finding the simple statement of your subject, whether it's a person or a portrait or a landscape or a, a concept for entertainment art. What's the simple statement of that? Lay in that clear, simple statement beautifully, clearly, and then add any information and artistry that's going to bring it up to the next level. It's a huge problem because our own nature works against us. We're in good company. You know, the other 7 billion people on the planet perceive things the same way that we do. But if we're going to be top-notch artists, we have to rise above what we do on autopilot. Definitely. Something that I see as well on this topic is that whenever I see your art, especially when you're doing like background cities, things like that, I see the way you manage lights, shadows, and all that. And I can immediately perceive that this is something that was earned through days and years of observing how light, shadow, the, the objects are pretty much with each other, as you mentioned. And that is something that will not happen through uh, downloading a brush or like putting a plugin into into Photoshop or After Effects or whatever. Uh, that is something that is takes place through, through years. Uh, so I wanted to ask you like how much time did to the point where you consider us like good enough and also like it's something that you keep improving even today. 
Yeah, Ro Rodrigo, I don't want to admit the truth to you. Um, it's, it's not complimentary to me, and it might be discouraging to the viewers, but um, I estimate I've spent somewhere in the range of 20,000 hours in life drawing. Whether it's uh, you know sketching from life, out painting landscapes, in the life drawing classroom, sketching people, I've been fanatical. I mean, I have been, I, I, it's just something that I just can't stop doing. I work a little bit more in the studio now, like I, I, I got married, I, I had kids, I, I have twins, and so I, uh, I'm a little bit more in the home studio than out and about that I was during all those years. But I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, you were asking that your your first question you're asking about you know um, the the drive to get started and, and be an artist and I'll tell you one of the moments I knew that I was going to be an, an artist and, and how that influenced uh, life drawing when I was in Boy Scouts as a as a kid uh, we had this high we we did these fundraisers and we had this high adventure trip to go to Hawaii. And so it was great. We went out to Hawaii. We were on the beach. We, we hiked up, you know, the, the volcano. It was a fantastic trip. And then, uh, uh, and then we had a free day where we could go do whatever we wanted. Well, I needed to stop by the mall there in, in Waikiki Beach. I needed to stop by the mall. And when I was in the mall, there was a portrait artist working. And I looked over a shoulder. It's in pastels they were beautiful they were really good and so i sat and watched him you know people came by and uh, post for him and he was selling these portraits from life and so i sat behind him and watched for a while and he would bang out in about half an hour he would bang out a gorgeous likeness of the person and i ended up sitting in the mall in hawaii all day long watching this guy didn't go to the beach. I didn't go out into the jungle. All the things that you're supposed to do in Hawaii. I watched this guy draw in rapture and he could do it in half an hour. It was extraordinary. So, you know, I knew I wasn't going to be an athlete. I knew I wasn't going to be a surfer. Um, uh, what you do in your, you know, what you do when you don't have to do anything else tells you, you know, who you are. And I, I knew that I had to do that. And, and fighting to uh, be that kind of an artist, but not just that, being able to capture the essence of the subject in a short period of time, you know, get to that simple statement. That's the thing that became very clear that this guy could do that I hoped for. And that was actually a little driving experience and a confirmation that uh, and being an artist was just, there wasn't a choice, that's what I was gonna do. Nice. This is a uh, question that I asked because uh, I'm 32 right now and I was one of these young guys uh, that when I was 20, uh, I was thinking that I had to do everything in my 20s because by 30, uh, like, life was over. And that's pretty much why they teach us here in El Salvador, like, once you're 30, like, life goes downhill and things like that. And after it took right now, and I'm still feeling, like, young. I still love what I do. I can see that I still have, like, 30, 40, 30, uh, 50 years ahead of me doing all this. Um, and that has created that sense of patience in me that it's like, oh, well, yeah, I, I can see myself doing this when I'm like 72, so uh, why not start doing it now? So, uh, But I see that young people have that impatience, as you say, like the generation of the internet and what they think now, now, now. Um, and now is something that I'm trying to drive into people through these interviews, like this idea idea that they have way more time than they think, uh, and that they have to relax and think it easy and, as you say, like learn to learn the skill. Uh, how would be your advice towards that? So the thing uh, that worked for me well and the uh, advice that I give to my students uh, takes practice, you know, talent's overrated, don't worry about if you have talent or not, it's too late, you know, we all are who we are. Uh, just focus on uh, focus on the effort and so I've spent especially uh, studying I'd spend about uh, 
a third of my practice time doing master copies, studying from the master, standing on the shoulders of giants. And then I would spend about a third of my practice time drawing and painting from life, going to the life drawing classes, getting outside and sketching landscapes. And then the other third would be from imagination, drawing and painting from imagination to make sure I wasn't just a copyist, you know, that I could apply what I was learning to my own ideas. And so between those three things, you know, sketch after sketch, day after day, carry your sketchbook around with you everywhere and get that mileage in. Get that, uh, get that hour a day in every single day, if not more than that, because that, that builds up. It's like an exponential curve. You don't just slowly improve when you do it on a daily basis. That curve starts moving upward in trajectory and really gets you to where you need to be. Definitely. I, I felt that I, what you say, like uh, in the beginning, it was like really slow, but at the same time, I, I, I was having that feeling of learning new things every day. Now I'm feeling that the feeling of learning new things have slowed down because I, like pretty much I already got like a little knowledge, but the more I practice, like the better I get like really, really fast. And there was one mentor of mine who told me that the, the value of knowledge was not mm -hmm on the novelty but in the utility and i started to see that uh i was trying to go into trying to get new things trying to get uh, this feeling of learning something new instead yeah. of watching this knowledge that i already had that i wasn't applying <laughs> that was like the very basics and the principles that i had to go back so now i'm trying to kind of moderate that uh how the and i think that applies as well to art as well right because there are as you say like many technologies that are coming up but at yeah. the end what saves you is the principle right you got it also uh i wanted to ask you what made you decide to go into being an independent artist? Because many people like uh, dream to work for Disney and DreamWorks and be there for all their lives. But I also see this new trend that there are many artists who see that opportunity in the beginning, that they are very excited, and then they go back into being their own independent, uh, uh, doing their own independent art. Uh, what made you go into this path? Yeah, you know, uh... I, I mentioned uh, I mentioned earlier I, I have twins I have twin boys they're seven years old and uh, I also have a daughter I have, I have three kids but um, I I was at I was at DreamWorks like I say for 15 years things were going really great uh, I, I was um, I I have I, I like to think I have a good amount of humility uh, about my work and the reason for that is at DreamWorks you're surrounded by the best artists in the world. It, it's, uh, you know, I couldn't believe the opportunity to be with these people and, and learn from them and, and try and fight to keep up because we're at the, the visual development hall at DreamWorks is where all these artists are and they're from all over the world. We had artists, we had a couple artists from China, one from Japan, artists from all over Europe, all over America, uh, uh, a couple, you know, from, uh, you know, uh, uh, one from, from Mexico and, and Brazil. Anyway, every, everywhere, it was just, it went on and on and on, uh, uh, literally all over the world. And you have to keep up with these people. And so I got to do that for 15 years. Uh, but then uh, I had a family and uh, the long hours and, and, you know, Los Angeles commutes are not short. And I got a call from Blue Sky Studios asking if I had any availability to work with them on some new projects. And they're over on the East Coast. Uh, I'm, I'm in Los Angeles and they're over on the, the East Coast in Connecticut uh, across the continent. And so they were willing to let me work from home. Well, my kids needed me uh, you know, at home. My wife needed me. And, uh, and so I made the break and started working from home. And I thought I would really miss, I thought I would really miss DreamWorks and I did, but working from home is so fantastic. You know, 
no one cares if you go take a nap. You can take a break and go play with your kids. Your your wife, you know, uh, uh, needs help with something, and and you know you can you can be there. And working from home, you know, I'm in my home studio here right now. It's the most fantastic thing. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm never going back. Uh, I work as an independent contractor for the studios now, and uh, and and it's really great. And I'll throw in, you know, I I only like to give art advice. I try not to give life advice because I'm not qualified. But the one bit of uh, life advice I like to joke with people about is if you are going to start a family, make sure you have twins because you can get out of anything when you have twins. Uh, someone asks you, hey, can you come give me a hand and, and help me move? You can say, oh, man, I'd love to help you. I've got the twins. You know, you don't, uh, and you can use it as an, as an excuse. So people always ask me, gosh, you know, how do you, how do you work? You know, you, uh, you got the family, you're, you're at home, you know, how do you work with all that other stuff going on? Uh, it's, it's actually, it's, I, I don't want to say it's been a breeze, but, um, um, I, I'm here, they're here. It's, uh, uh, it's, we're having a great time. It's smooth sailing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I totally agree with you on, on the topic of working on. Uh, I have friends who have tried that. They didn't work for them. They needed the, like the office space or something unique for work. So they ended up like going into co-working space and rented office and things like that. I tried that and completely hated it. <laughs> so, I definitely agree with you on the on the benefits of working home, but I do think that it's not like completely for everybody. So, uh, on the topic of working home and in order to do deep work and and focus on strengths of work that help you get advanced, what will be your advice for that? To uh, say again to so people can get to the point that they can work from home? Uh, no, uh, I think there are like a kind of uh, difficulties that, for example, when I started working home, the first yeah. week was like completely wasted. <laughs> I didn't do anything until I started getting into the, into the loop of working. What would be your advice in order to get work done from home without getting too much distracted? I got you. Um, so uh, deadlines, um, deadlines definitely are a motivating factor. You know, you, you can't, if you're going to work from home and you're going to tell them, no, I'm not coming into the studio, I work from home, then you've got to deliver. And if you don't come through, you're dead, you know, and I'm very aware of that. And so that's a, a highly motivating factor. But I, I, I have to say, I, I kind of have the, the opposite problem. Um, this is what I do. I, I absolutely love it. Yeah, it's it's frustrating and, and has its hang-ups, but I, I end up with the opposite problem where I want to work as an artist to the exclusion of all else. You know, my problem is I probably should let myself get a little bit more distracted and go do something else for a while. Uh, and I, I, I think a, a lot of us get like that. Uh, we, we love this. We want to keep hammering at it, like I say, to the exclusion of of uh, of all else, so uh, uh, yeah, I don't. I I guess I don't have the same problem. Yeah, I think for me it was more like a mental shift because yeah, definitely in the beginning I was like sweating up a lot, but uh, once I did that mental shift, uh, I was able to do a lot of work. And as you say, like it's something that I truly enjoy. It's not something that it feels like work. I, Especially in the beginning, I started working on because I had a business of web design that I was doing more on the economical side. But when I when I changed that to the animation studio and doing this kind of artwork, I was doing like five times the work, and it didn't feel like it. Like it felt so natural. So I think that doing something that we love is is important as well. Well, I'll, I'll tell you though, I, I do have, um, I, I like to, uh, when I get in the studio in the morning, uh, I like to turn on some, you know, uh, energetic music. I have reference files and different things that I'm inspired by, you know, artwork, stuff other people have done that I feel like is beyond me, that I, I, I want to keep working up to that level. And I, I do, I, I 
like to go through those things. It, it kind of gets my uh, my competitive spirit up, and uh, and then it makes me really want to dive in harder and faster. And so I do have my little life hacks where uh, I, I try and get myself into a state of motivation because it doesn't uh, it doesn't always just automatically happen. Uh, gotta in there and work yourself to a point where you feel that state of motivation and enthusiasm. Um, it's it's not automatically going to show up for you. Yeah, definitely. Also, uh, I, I know that you are doing a new book, right? Uh, a new book? Yes. I am. Uh, uh, I haven't started yet, but I am. Uh, well, I'm just getting the ball rolling on it. Uh, I'm going to do a book on uh, landscape sketching. One of the things that I'm just fanatical about is getting out with my watercolor kit, my gouache kit, and doing somewhere in the range of one hour studies from life, you know, before the light changes, before the conditions change, trying to do a sketch that I hope captures that momentary effect of light and atmosphere. I love, I love that. And uh, I, I put up a class, you know, my, my schoolism classes are on concept art and uh, and that kind of art but recently I put up a class on painting landscapes and I'm gonna translate that also into a book over the next year so don't look for it next year things are pretty busy but the year after I'll have this book out and I I hope it'll help people navigate you know uh, you me and everyone else the first time I think we all went out to sketch a landscape in color it was a disaster. I don't know anyone who uh, didn't go out with their watercolors the first day and, and do something beautiful. It's, oh my gosh. I've got, uh, you know, having fought that fight uh, for 20 years and, and, you know, been humiliated by the disasters, I, I've, got a few, uh, I've got a few tricks up my sleeve on, on how to get past that uh, without all the pain and suffering I went through and I want to share those in it. They're in my class now and I want to share those in book form as well. So thank you for asking me about that. Uh, my publisher is Design Studio Press who they put out the, the most fantastic how-to art books, traditional concept art, mech, uh, perspective, what, whatever. Um, the, they're a fantastic publisher. So if people are looking for good art books, I advise Design Studio Press. Nice. Also, uh, I wanted to ask you more details about the class of Schoolism. Uh, it's been now, I think, a year since we had a picture from the Schoolism, so there are many new people who are watching our interviews now who don't know much about it. Uh, so, uh, can you, for those people who don't know about what a Schoolism is about and uh, your classes in it, uh, can you give us more details about it? Sure, yeah, thank you. So my class is specifically, uh, uh, as, an, as an artist, of course, we've, we've had a good discussion, Rodrigo, about hitting the foundation of draftsmanship and perspective and, and the basics. And so uh, my classes then step from there into concept art. Uh, my classes are designing with color and light, uh, environment design, composition. Because once we have the basic foundational skills, if you want to work in video game design, uh, art, art design, the visual side of it, animation, live action film as an artist, those are the three things that we all have to be masters of. Really connecting with and communicating the, with the audience through the design and motion of color and light. We have to be able to create places, environments, you know, every, just about every drawing and painting we do, it's set in a place. We have to be masters of creating compelling places. And then as artists, we do our work in the form of pictures. We have to be master picture makers. And so my third class in concept art is pictorial composition. And then, like I said, we have somewhere in the range of 20, 25 instructors, uh, uh, introduction to digital painting, uh, uh, character design, the list just goes on and on, uh, some other traditional painting classes. And how it works is uh, my lessons are pre-recorded so the students can watch them whenever they want, at home, at their convenience. And then they do the assignments and they send their assignments to me through the Schoolism website. 
And then I record uh, feedback. I do screen capture feedback where I spend at least, uh, I'll spend uh, a you know, good, good 20 minutes, sometimes longer, talking through their work, painting over their painting, bring, really taking the work they did and, and bringing that final polish, correction, and finish to it so they know, you know what they didn't know to get that painting done. Then I send it back to them and they can watch it at their convenience at home, anywhere in the world. So that's why schoolism, I think, is doing so well. It hits people where they need it. Definitely. Like, again, uh, I tell this to a lot of my friends, especially who are into art. Like, again, the schools that we have here are not like the best. Uh, they focus more on graphic design. And there are people who want to go into illustration or concept design and things like that. And I'm telling them because the schools here charge a lot of money. And the teachers there, like, are not, they don't have that kind of experience. So I just told them, yeah. like, uh, you're going to save way more time and earn so much more if you go into uh, a school with you, and also you're going to save a lot of money there. That, We're that, here for you. We are, we are here for you. Definitely. Also, this is a, a hard question that I like to ask as well to all the people that I interview. Uh, let's say you wake up tomorrow and you wake up into uh, another dimension and nobody knows about you, you don't have like all, uh, your fame, you don't have your context and things like that, but you have all your knowledge and you have $500 in your pocket. What do you do to get, uh, to get something done and to get to this position that you are right now as fast as possible? Uh. Uh, well, I'd have to go. Uh, I'd have to go straight to the art store. I, I guess I'd have to put together a portfolio real fast. And uh, so I, I guess let, let's assume I, I have uh, I, I have a little space. I can find a little space somewhere. I'd have to go straight to the art store with five hundred bucks. I I couldn't uh, afford digital equipment, but um, I'd have to sit down. And here's what I would think about. You know. Uh, who do I want to be noticed by and you know as a, as a traditional artist and and a, an animation artist uh, the thing that I would need people to connect with my work would need to have some emotion you know with those limitations that you just described the work I came up with would have to immediately be engaging you know to uh, and I'll, I'll say this uh, I think the job of an artist is to connect with people on a, an emotional level. Uh, and the moment that we as artists can do that, can connect with our audience at that gut emotional level where art and storytelling lives, no matter what we're not good at, the moment we can do that, we're an artist. We are officially an artist. I tell all my students that. And so I would sit down and try and create some artwork. I'd get some acrylics, some charcoal, and create some pictures that I felt were emotionally engaging. Then I'd get out there, you know, I'd, I'd hit the beat and uh, show them around, uh, visit some of the studios, try and connect with local artists and get a little network, you know, uh, uh, with, with some of these people, build that network, get noticed, try and push deeper and deeper into the emotional connection of art. And uh, I think opportunities would come the way of anyone who did that successfully. Also, this is something that I have forgotten to ask other people, but now that you mentioned it, I, I just remember about that. Many people tell me that they will go to a studios to show the art, uh, who will you look in for a studio? Like, what will be the position of the person that you will look in a studio to show your art? Um, are, are you asking about? Um, uh, are you asking about what kind of work they should have in their portfolio, or what are the positions that are available? No, uh, pretty much. If you would like to show uh, your work in a studio. Uh, yeah. Let's say, which will be the person that you will ask to talk to in order to show your work? Uh, is like a recruiter 
for like a marketing manager or something like that? Well, if you have no connection to the studio, there's not much choice. You uh, you you know, you have to go through their recruiting process. But I don't advise it. Um, it goes through uh, it goes through human resources. It initially goes through people who are, are who are not artists. It's sorted out, and it's a very uh, uh, you know they don't know you even if your work is pretty good. At any good studio, pretty good isn't good enough, and they don't know you. They don't know you know. Are you going to show up on time? Are you difficult to work with? Are you just going to be more trouble than you're worth? They don't know, and so. The worst, uh, the worst option is to coldly put, submit your portfolio over the internet. Nobody there knows you. Um, and I don't do that at all, ever. Um, I only work by reputation where uh, uh, try and make myself known to the people at the studios, the art directors, people that I've worked with in the past. Because my goal is someone's doing a new movie, they sit down and say, okay, we need people. Who are we going to contact? My hope is that somebody in that room says, oh, you know, I, I worked with Nathan Fowkes on a project several years ago. You know, um, he's not the best artist in the world, but his work is solid. He's competent. You know, he showed up on time. It was good to work with. You know, uh, he, he must have had bad days, but he never showed it. You know, he showed up every day with a smile on his face, probably faking it. Uh, but that's what we need, you know. Um, um, leave leave your bad mood at home and uh, and kind of light up the studio with your with your presence. And I want someone in the room to say uh, to say that to the group and say, okay, let's contact him. Let's see if he's available. And they might say, well, you know, he'll he'll be a little bit more expensive than you know a, a junior artist. Let's say, well, you know, we uh, uh, let's just do it. You know, we don't have time to take a chance with an unknown entity. So my advice to everyone is uh, start small, work for you know some small jobs, freelance jobs, small studios, and make yourself known and develop your reputation. And you make sure that that reputation is stellar. And I'll just throw one more thing. You know, I worked with an artist many years ago who is a good artist, but at the same time, you know, he's pretty. We're all we're all moody. You know, it's just it's it's how we are. It's how most people are. But this guy had a temper problem. And I remember one time he, he kind of flipped out. He kicked a trash can across the room, ran over, stomped up and down on it, and made quite a spectacle uh, of himself right, right there in, in front of everybody. And this guy's a, a, a good artist. But whenever I think of him, that's what I think of. I think of that. I don't think of all the great paintings he might have done. I think of that one incident. It's unfortunate. I try not to think like that, but it's human nature. And when it comes to our reputation, we cannot allow a single doubt or weakness to show. And so that's the target I think up and comers should shoot for. Definitely. I, I had experience like that as well, where we either uh, work with somebody who was a great artist, but because they were like really close friends they were unable to get into that kind of professional mentality, mindset into the work, and kind of didn't deliver properly, or they show up some other issues like that, or things like that. Uh, even though they were like great, great, great artists, like that was it, like we, we, we didn't work with them anymore. And I there's, there's no time. We're, you know, we're all under a production schedule, right? There's just not time to mess around. We gotta, you know, we gotta get the job done. Who can help us do that? Yeah, and, and I, and, and this is something that I hear from everybody from all over the world. Like they tell me, I would rather go for somebody who has a decent talent, but has like a, a really good personality, and work ethic, and delivers some time and all this, than an amazing artist who is flaky, who has bad mood, and yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you one more, because I got a call that I really appreciated not long ago, uh, and an art director at one of the studios called me. And he said, uh, he said, hey, listen, do you have any availability? We're working with so-and-so artist, 
and uh, and you know we're we're finding him hard to work with, and we're wondering if if you might have availability to to step in. Well, the artist that they were talking about, this person is extraordinary, and I have no problem saying this it, for the kind of work that he was doing. Me, I'm still fighting. I'm I, I'm still fighting to to make sure someday I won't have to say he's better than me. I can't stand that. Uh, but I have no problem, you know, telling the truth. This guy, what he does, I look up to him, not down. And yet, I got that phone call. He's better than me, but they said, Nathan, we would rather have you. And it was a matter of workability. You know, someone who can be a team player and really contribute. There's just not, there's, there's not time, budget, stress. They need his, there's all... There's already so much frustration and difficulty built into the process of just making these movies that there people can't take more of it. It just it'll 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 bring the art department to a breaking point if someone adds to the difficulty. So that's that's one example that um, our skill set is more than just art. Yes. Uh, is there any last advice or any last things that you would like to mention uh, to the people that we haven't talked about? Well, that's a good question. You know, um, uh, we've we've got one shot at this thing. Uh, there's no time to waste. Uh, most of us who 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 do this, it's it's what we want to do. It's part of who we are, and so before we know it, it'll all be over. And I'll I'll tell you, um, when when we're gone, you know, when when that end comes, all the things that we let hold us back, all the things that we fear, they don't add up to anything. They are absolutely nothing. The only thing that's actually left is what we actually did. And I think we have to have that attitude every single day because, you know, you, you just don't know. You only know what the only thing we know for sure that we can accomplish is what we do today. So, you know, I sit down and one of my little, little life hacks, one of my little tricks is uh, as a teacher, I have to do demonstrations and that's difficult for me. You have these people looking over your shoulder and they're expecting you to do something good and you're sweating. You're like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow this thing and, uh, and everyone will think, well, gosh, maybe he's not the artist we thought. You know, the pressure's on. And so when I'm doing a demo, I have to be fast. I have to be clear. I have to have my concept in mind and I have to know how to attack that concept to bring that idea across with clarity and with artistry to the audience. And so what I try and do every day when I sit down to do my own work, no one's looking over my shoulder. I pretend like I'm in a demo. I pretend like people are looking over my shoulder. I've got to work fast. I've got to work effectively. My work has to be clear to the point. I can't go wander off, you know, and get distracted. I can't kind of wander off into never, never land and let my piece drift away into something that's not working. And so that's how I keep myself focused that, that, uh, the, uh, the, the authority and the, the distress of doing a demonstration, nothing focuses us and someone like me as much as that does. So that's my little trick on a daily basis to get the job done. Nice. If people want to find you online, where would be the best places to find your work and all about you? Yeah, thanks. I keep social media up. I'm Nathan Falks Art on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, thing. Uh, if you go to NathanFalksArt.com, that's just kind of a jumping off website where it has links to all my social media and my classes and, and that sort of a thing. And so people can go to any of those places. You might start at NathanFalksArt.com so you can see where I am and just jump to any of those links. Nice. 
thanks a lot for being here, Nathan, and for giving us a little bit of your time. I know you're a really busy person, so I truly appreciate that you were here uh, giving us all your advice. Oh, thank you so much, Rodrigo. Yeah, real pleasure. And please, uh, if you have liked this video and this, this interview, please click the like button in the video below. And also share this with all your friends so we can spread the knowledge. Until next time.